Well, we're here today to discuss a report that David and Eben uh, wrote uh, over the last year, came out in, in late August, called Plutonium Mountain, and it's uh, the story of uh, the locking down of uh, dangerous nuclear materials at the former Soviet test site in Semipalatinsk. So, uh, so the, the area where Deglin Mountain sits um, is in the eastern region of Kazakhstan. Uh, it's called Semipalatinsk. And uh, Dostoevsky was actually exiled to that region in 1854. Uh, by all accounts, he didn't seem to mind it at all. He said he felt he could breathe there for the first time. He loved the long, unrelenting step, the limitless horizons. He fell in love with a local woman. By all accounts, it was a happy time for him. I had a different experience when I visited last year. <laughs> Certainly the area is quite beautiful in an austere, brutal, windswept way, but all that space invites your imagination to fill the emptiness, to imagine the some 116 atmospheric nuclear explosions that once lit the steppe around Semipalatinsk during so the Soviet Union's Cold War testing program. It's a spooky place. <clears throat> Kurchatov City itself which was formerly known as Semipalatinsk 21, was the secret city that was the staging ground for the Soviet Union testing program. It's full of derelict buildings, burnt out cars, and feral dogs. In some ways, nuclear weapons ended up destroying the city if you believe that it was the massive and unsupportable arms race that eventually topple, helped topple the Soviet Union. The weapons designed to protect the Soviet Union ended up playing a large role in destroying it. I find a certain grim irony in that. I texted David when I arrived, something along the lines of, this is the saddest place I've ever seen. He texted back, presumably drawing on memories of his reporting in and around Russia in the 1990s. Imagine a whole continent that sad. Each night when I went to bed, I would place my hiking boots next to the door, as far away from my bed as possible, at the advice of one of the fellows here at the Managing the Atom Project, who warned me that if there were radioactive particles in Semipalatinsk, they might be in the soil and would be binded to my shoes, so I should keep them away from me when I slept. I would stare at them from the edge of my bed in a flush of vodka, jet lag, and indigestion-induced misery and think to myself, what a mess. And make no mistake, Semipalatinsk was a mess, a huge, depressing, disgusting, repulsive mess. The details are told in our paper about one aspect of it, but here is the recap. The Soviet Union performed a whole host of different nuclear tests in Kazakhstan, not just big explosion, explosions, but studies of the effects of explosive shocks on plutonium metal, and safety tests designed to ensure that weapons didn't explode in the case of an accident or a fire or a collision or a plane crash. Many of these tests left behind not just dangerous radioactive residue, but recoverable plutonium in HEU, bomb fuel. When they withdrew, the Soviet Union left all the plutonium in place. The most dangerous areas were a series of tunnels that housed underground tests called Deglin Mountain and nearby boreholes. The Soviet Union performed 340 underground nuclear explosions and many more that probably aren't counted because they didn't involve high yields. In the aftermath of the USSR's collapse, scavengers broke into Deglin Mountain to steal copper, steel, anything of value they could get their hands on. US scientists and officials became aware of the problem and the mission to secure the material at Deglin Mountain began. That led to a 17-year mission to try to render safe and secure the testing area that went in various stages. In the first stage, the US paid to plug up the ends of the tunnels. Then it was discovered that thieves and scavengers had broken through the portals of the tunnels, through the plugged up entrances, and were stealing material again. In some cases, even violating the explosive chambers containing plutonium residue. In one instance, the assurance that the Russian scientists had that no plutonium residue was stolen was that there were no scrape marks on the wall. That's obviously a dangerous situation. The US conducted tests in the 1950s during fears of a plutonium shortage that conclusively demonstrated that plutonium from nuclear experiments could be recycled into a workable nuclear device. So what followed was a period of formal and informal diplomatic wrangling between both high and low level US officials and scientists. David will talk a little bit more about that. To pry a full inventory of what was left in Deglin Mountain out of the Russians so that a full remediation project could be completed. That dragged on for almost 15 years and happened in various stages. Eventually, the tunnels were filled at Deglin Mountain with concrete, and boreholes where other residue existed were covered with a giant concrete sarcophagus. It actually took their inspiration from the concrete envelope that was placed over Chernobyl. <laughs> so the end, sort of, and we'll talk a little bit about that. What both David and I noticed as we reconstructed the tick-tock of the operation was how often 
short-term thinking and addressing problems that were immediately pressing took precedence over larger issues of sustainability. It took 17 years to, to secure Deccan Mountain, a period that saw the rise of Al-Qaeda, the 9-11 attacks, the war in Afghanistan, etc., etc. David and I have different views about whether the short-term thinking was dispensable, given the urgent security imperatives faced by decision makers at the time. We can probably debate that a bit more today. But I found it very troubling and a good reminder to policymakers to be humble about our abilities to foresee future threats and to recognize that policy decisions must be made in the knowledge that the world will change far more dramatically and suddenly than we would like. So to me, the story of Deglin Mountain has two threads. On the one hand, you have individual heroism. On the other hand, you, you have what I think was sort of a collective failure. The individual heroism I saw firsthand in officials working in dangerous circumstances to overcome mistrust from former enemies to deal with an urgent security problem. But despite these individuals and their best efforts, it still took almost 20 years to deal with this problem. So how, how do we think about those two issues, about how the individuals on the one hand were making progress and breaking through, but at the same time it took so long to deal with the issue? I want to focus on this latter issue of collective failure and where Deglin Mountain fell short. I don't know, perhaps I'm still too idealistic or I think the world should be a little bit more perfect. Let's start with the Soviet testing program. Their immediate imperative of designing niftier hydrogen bombs trumped any concerns over long-term environmental or security implications. It just did. There were dozens of wasteful tests, often the result of competition between the two main Soviet nuclear weapons labs, rather than actual scientific need. It's estimated that each atmospheric explosion caused an average of 6,000 premature deaths from fallout. And of course, the underground tests left material in place. Short-term thinking ruled the day. Next, you have the tunnel closure program in the early 1990s in which the portals were closed. At the time, the U.S. was focused on closing the portals so that Kazakhstan couldn't reconstitute a testing program. Many knew that dangerous material remained inside. But theft and terrorism just wasn't a priority. Short-term thinking ruled the day. The tunnels, tunnels were continuously breached by scavengers through the 2000s. We call them scavengers, but it was quite clear for me during my reporting that it was actually the same construction crews who had helped the U.S. and Kazakh and Russians with the work in the first place. They were just basically moonlighting to try and steal more material out of the tunnels, which makes sense to me. You try and squeeze as much out of every asset that you have, right? So when confronted with evidence of scavenging, Russia was slow to cough up information about what was in the tunnels and where it was buried. They were concerned, apparently, that the U.S. would use work in the tunnels to discover the isotopic mixture of the plutonium used in Soviet and now Russian nuclear weapons, which is a secret in Russia. Short-term thinking ruled the day. The Kazakhs, by all accounts, had genuine concerns about the material, and I do believe they sought a long-term solution. But their short-term needs also unduly influenced policy. Specifically, they seemed fairly happy to watch the threat reduction work drag on and on. U.S. officials on the ground in Kazakhstan mumbled to me continuously that the Kazakhs viewed the remediation work as a jobs program. On my visit, they put me through this semi-sort of absurd pageant in which they simulated an attack on Deglin Mountain. From a state-of-the-art security control room in Kanchatov City, which have, you have to imagine in this gleaming sort of uh, war room environment was kind of out of place considering the burnt out derelict of what was outside. They showed me how remote monitoring systems, uh, seismic sensors, uh, a, even a U.S. supplied drone allowed them to keep an eye on Declan Mountain. And I watched a SWAT-like response team from a nearby base intercept a mock intrusion. It was an absurd piece of theater. First of all, U.S. officials claimed that the remediation work, essentially, as I mentioned before, dumping tons of concrete into the tunnels and covering separate boreholes with a concrete sarcophagus, had rendered the material secure. So why the need for a SWAT team? Then, of course, the thought that Kazakhstan was going to pay the millions of dollars required to maintain all this high-tech equipment and monitoring uh, facilities over, the, over time seemed outrageous, given, as I mentioned, that they apparently you know, were having difficulty affording to upkeep their buildings, feed their dogs, etc. Details about the full extent of the threat at Semipalatinsk became clear through years of trust building between U.S. and Russian scientists and officials, by which I took to mean, through my visits there, interminable vodka-fueled toasts between the two. But even when, even when the work was completed in 2010, I could find no evidence that the solution found, the aforementioned concretization, is an acceptable long-term remediation technique. <coughs> 
cement immobilization of large amounts of plutonium is an unproven technology. What's more, Deglin Mountain is surrounded by legitimate mining operations, including a fluoride mine that is literally without eyesight of the tunnels. The plutonium is still in place. As of the end of our reporting, there was no IAEA safeguards protocol to monitor or account for the material. Will the material be safe, secure, and accounted for over anything more than the immediate future? Kazakhstan's current president, Nazarbayev, has been exemplary in his commitment to nonproliferation, but he's a dictator with no clear successor. What happens after him? And if it's not a sustainable solution, what now? Dig up all that cement and concrete? What damage have we done to international law and the authority of the IAEA by essentially keeping them out of the process, which we did? So I worry that even now, even all, after all that time, the mess at Semipalatinsk remains just that, a mess, albeit a smaller one. So to recap, during the Cold War, we couldn't see past the immediate superpower threat. In the aftermath, when we scrambled to plug the holes to the testing tunnels to stop Kazakhstan reconstituting a testing program, we couldn't see past the proliferation threat. Now are we making the same mistake and focusing only on the threat immediately in front of us, terrorism? Are we forgetting about the long-term environmental and proliferation threats? Short-term thinking is particularly pernicious in the nuclear realm given the disconnect between the half-life of civilizations and fissile material. 24,000 years, the half-life of plutonium is essentially eternity on a human time scale. I was deeply troubled by a recent observation by Belfort Center's own William Tobey that seven of the ten largest economies in the world suffered unexpected regime change in the last hundred years. hundred years is a tiny fraction of a second on an atomic clock. That insight makes ending all aspects of the nuclear threat, including total disarmament, an absolute imperative in my view. France, Britain, China, Russia, India, Pakistan, Israel, the United States, these countries won't outlive their nuclear weapons. That seems to me indisputable. Unless, of course, they destroy them. And when it comes to fissile material, simply putting it under lock and key isn't a sustainable solution when you know that the watchman will inevitably be survived but by what he is there to watch. We need sustainable solutions to the nuclear threat. God knows that will be difficult, but it's necessary. I wanted to end with one other sort of uh, kind of more abstract point that I came to think about as I was reporting this piece with David, which is that we, and by we I mean nonproliferation wonks, arms control experts, deterrence theorists, even uh, disarmament advocates, we tend to think of nuclear weapons as these sort of discrete magical objects on the top of missiles or in bomber bays or uh, nuclear subs that just kind of appear out of nowhere. We ponder and debate their utility as weapons or as tools of deterrence as if they were just these discrete objects. But if you look closer, however, as we did at Deglin Mountain, you realize that nuclear weapons require an incredibly messy supply chain <coughs> and one that leaves behind dangers that last for millennia. Sure, the residual danger is small, but that small danger has a very large multiplier. I would argue that the value that some of us put into nuclear weapons does not include a full accounting of nuclear weapons' messy start or their long tail. Much like bankers failed to correctly value complex mortgage-backed securities because they simply failed to ask the right questions about what those nasty CDOs and other toxic de debt instruments actually contained, where they came from, and what their long-term risks might be. At the very least, I hope the mess left behind at Semipalatinsk will inform our calculations when we discuss nuclear weapons and their role in international security, and that we fully account for nuclear weapons' nasty beginning, their tense middle, and their long, uncertain ending. Thanks, Evan, and thanks for having me, Marty and Matt. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, um, I'd like to just add two more points to Evan's presentation. One of the very most important things in this report is on page 30 here. I think we probably should have put it in neon flashing lights, but it's just in cold type there. And on that page, we tell you that Russia left behind uh, some equipment that, and I quote, included high purity plutonium that would have easily provided materials and information that could lead to a relatively sophisticated nuclear device, close quote. Now, this uh, legacy of the Cold War, this residue that was left behind, was discovered in 2005. 
when the Nun Luger program, the United States government program to deal with some of these problems was already about 13 years old and had spent a very uh, $400, $450 million a year, not a very tiny fraction of our national defense budget. Um, so maybe a billion and a half dollars for operations that actually were all over the former Soviet Union, many of them wise and well thought out and not always easily implemented. But this particular one, high purity plutonium, sitting in the bottom of a little workspace, a stall or an end box as it was called, inside a tunnel in a mountain in Kazakhstan, was completely missed by governments, by all this spending. And I think you know, only in 2007, we report, was eventually the thing opened up and the Russians uh, packed it up and put it in the train and despite a lot of problems, took it back to Russia. They have never actually told Evan and I precisely what this was, but you can gather from that quote that it was probably pretty significant. So I'd like to point out to you that governments, the United States, several administrations, Russia, through Yeltsin and well into the Putin era, Kazakhstan, governments did not find this high purity plutonium, which I'm sure place, you know, Iran and North Korea and a few others would have loved to have known about. In fact, uh, I worked in the media all this time as a journalist. I didn't find it either, and news media didn't have a clue. It was scientists and engineers who actually help bring this to light. And they weren't, um, in many cases, working in a program. They were freelancing. They were just doing something uh, out of curiosity. The real driving force that led to the discovery and later the remediation of this high purity plutonium and equipment and all the rest at Deglin Mountain was Dr. Sig Hecker of Stanford University, the former uh, director of Los Alamos National Laboratory. And one of the things that really interested me is how does something like this happen? How does a fellow like Sig, who happened to have retired, as stepped down as director of Los Alamos and is uh, deciding to set out on a period of his life where he would work in nonproliferation, how does something like this come about? And it's clear that one of the prerequisites was simply his knowledge. He, for most of his career, was a metallurgist. And so he certainly understood very well the properties of plutonium and fissile material. That's what he had worked on at Los Alamos. And secondly, he had spent a lot of time in the, in the late Soviet period and in Russia visiting the, the laboratories there and studying their programs. He'd made more than 20 trips there and uh, built bridges to the various scientists there. You know, in intelligence, there are oftentimes warnings about this practice of mirroring. The warnings in intelligence are that sometimes, often in the United States in the Cold War, we took our procedures and our understanding about how something happened, how a weapon was built, how a process was conducted, and we applied it to the other side and said, they must be doing it too. Um, this often led to some big miscalculations, uh, for example, in the case of Star Wars. But in this particular case, Sig engaged in a little bit of mirroring. He knew that we, the United States, in uh, doing early testing of our nuclear weapons for safety, had carried out hydronuclear tests which involved blowing up bits of plutonium that were just in a, in a hole, um, just to see how the plutonium reacted to a heat fire blast. And by mirroring that, he was naturally curious about whether the Soviet Union had carried out hydronuclear tests what did he have to work on? Semipolitinsk, the polygon over hundreds of square miles, was top secret. There weren't any uh, Americans who could set foot in the place during the Cold War, but we did have overhead satellite intelligence, and we did notice from some of that some odd things going around, you know, trailers being towed out there in the vicinity of Deglin Mountain, holes drilled, bulldozers coming afterwards, everybody scampering off site. But there wasn't much. And in 1995, one of uh, SIG's deputies, uh, an intelligence guy at Los Alamos, went to Kazakhstan when it had just opened up after the Soviet collapse. And he actually visited this site 
And he came back convinced that that's where they had done their hydronuclear testing, you know, blowing up fissile material in the uh, to test. It. And he wrote a report about it saying, you know, uh, we ought to do something about this. And this was right at the time, the same year that the United States repatriated or took this large amount of highly enriched uranium from Kazakhstan in Project Sapphire. And this particular fellow wrote a memo saying, well, we ought to have one after Sapphire, let's call it Project Amber. And he laid out the problem in this memo, which Eben and I received from Dr. Hecker for, in our research. And then nothing happened to it for a while. 96, 97, and in 98, so about two years later, a Kazakh nuclear scientist came to Los Alamos on an exchange program. Very smart idea of the United States to give Kazakhstan some money to help exchange. And on this exchange program, the guy sought out Hecker and he said, you know, we're picking up a lot of radiation in the soil in Samipalatinsk. We don't really know, but when we go out there, you know, there seem to be isotopes everywhere. And here's where you have the epiphany, where a guy who understood metallurgy, who understood the kind of tests we had done, who had uh, some information from that Project Amber report said, what? And of course, then the Kazakh told him, oh, by the way, there are scavengers digging huge trenches through this soil. And in a few months, Sig was there. You know, he was on the ground. He saw the, sca- the traces of the scavengers. He realized immediately the risk that somebody could take a shovel. I'm oversimplifying here, but the risk that someone would essentially bring an excavator in and dig up this plutonium and carry it away. And anybody that remembers Kazakhstan from the, from the 90s, it would not be very hard to imagine another country coming in and doing that and driving it out in a truck. And in Project Sapphire, a whole crate of beryllium was discovered at Uskamanogorsk in that factory that was uh, had a shipping label for Iran on it. So it, it was not uh, something that I think uh, was implausible. And after that, SIG began to press... Uh, the United States came back and gave a briefing in the energy department in the United States, <coughs> began to press the Russians um, and the Kazakhs to do something, that we needed to understand the extent of the problem. Again, here's a guy, he's not officially part of the United States government, um, he has connections, he had knowledge, he put it together and essentially caused the three states the three nations with all of their power and expertise to get together to do something uh, that they had not done on their own. And I think this uh, dynamic is very, very important for us to understand because it actually wasn't the first time in this non-Luger period of 20 years that uh, this individual uh, kind of uh, sensibility and curiosity (laughs) and determination led to important gains. And we saw it in Project Sapphire, where Andy Weber uh, single-handedly tried to energize Washington on the need to get this highly enriched uranium out of Kazakhstan. And we saw it in Stepnogorsk, in the, you know, where there was a giant anthrax factory. And I could go on and on. We, we saw it in several of the Minatom, uh, you know, fissile material facilities that we saw for the first time in the 90s, when a fellow named Ken Fairfax who was in the Moscow embassy, started pushing into these facilities and realizing that they were still using old, uh, dirty ledgers to to do their nuclear materials accounting. Over and over again, we see this uh, individuals making this difference and not institutions. And I, I have a friend who says that we know the common types of intelligence. Human intelligence, called human, and signals intelligence, or electronic intelligence called SIGINT or ELINT. But he says, we often overlook two other kinds of intelligence. One of them is called GOINT, and the other is called ASKINT. (laughs) And GOINT and ASKINT played an important role in some of these really important discoveries that we're talking about here today. Um, Not necessarily the kind of questions that could be answered by our hugely expensive and powerful overhead satellite intelligence or by our uh, legions of diplomats and and, uh, intelligence case officers. What Hecker did was go and ask. No summits, no treaties, no belabored treaty negotiations. And I think that this detective work raises a question. How do we make sure that 
next time we're at the front lines of a transition, when a country that has nuclear weapons collapses, when the walls weaken, that we have another Sig Hecker and another Andy Weber pushing open the doors. What lessons can we take from the work? What lessons can we actually institutionalize to make sure that we get in? And one of the very, very big lessons, which I think is um, hard for governments to grasp and certainly needs to be learned in Washington today, is that this work is not uh, only careful engineering, physics, scientific work. It's not only the calipers measuring the chunks of plutonium in the half-life. It's really about people. It's about breaking down the barriers of suspicion and mistrust. And in the case of uh, Deglin Mountain, when that Kazakh scientist came to see Sig Hecker and Sig said, can I come to Kazakhstan and look? And then when he went to Russia and begged them to open the drawers and give him the data, um, it was about trust. It was about breaking down the whole Cold War's um, edifice of hostility and suspicion. And uh, I think that the big takeaway from this report is how seriously secrecy, suspicion, and mistrust, which are, you know, things in our minds, um, impede our ability to deal with some of these very serious proliferation threats, and will the next time. And the answer is, don't go charging in there and say, open the door. The answer is to figure out um, what's in the minds of the people that you're dealing with. Uh, I think particularly if we're going to think about the next time the walls come down, we should realize that there are people behind those walls who feel defeated, who feel humiliated, who feel they've lost their life's work, and may feel that the thing that they're guarding and the secrets that they have are some kind of valuable asset. And this was a hard, hard lesson to learn, but I think in retrospect it's very clear that we need to deal with the mindset as well as the fissile material. My second point is this. Um, Harold Smith was the Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration. And I bumped into him at, at a conference recently where I had passed out a copy of our uh, printed report, which you see behind me. And Harold was sitting at the conference and ignoring the conference and couldn't tear himself away from this thing we had written. And so I, he came right up to me at the break and he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, David, I can't believe this. I was the guy that ordered and paid for those tunnels to be closed. What the hell happened? Well, his question was really, really important. In the early 1990s, Dr. Smith had essentially, as a Pentagon official, come up with the funds and the method for uh, closing these 181 uh, tunnels at Deglin Mountain, which was part of the Soviet testing site and was his intention to make sure that the Soviet testing site could not be uh, used again for testing. Irreversibility was the goal then because the Soviet Union had collapsed, but we weren't really sure what would happen in a few years. Um, would Kazakhstan open it, semi politics for, for business for testing? So irreversibility, in other words, stopping them from using it again, um, seemed to be a pretty worthy goal at the time and for the millions of dollars that we spent. And the decisions were made uh, in a time of some urgency, where obviously there are, were trade-offs, and one of the trade-offs that was made in closing these tunnels was that the Americans and the Kazakhs who did the plugs would not walk any further than 50 meters into the tunnel. Now, at the time, since the goal was to close them off, that seemed like an okay request, and we uh, agreed to that. It was a condition. And in fact, of course, we know now that deeper into the tunnels, in many of them, was the plutonium that we're writing about. Residues, or in this case, one case, something uh, highly pure plutonium. And that, you know, had the fellows in the 1995 gone further than 50 meters, maybe 100 or 200, they might have seen something. But they didn't. This experience, that this trade-off, was repeated throughout the two decades of the non-Luger program. Because, you know, with hindsight, of course, it's tempting for us to talk about some kind of failure, collective failure. Why didn't they know what was in Deglin Mountain? Why didn't they know what was in the bottom? But, of course, history 
is lived forwards and written backwards. I think for the most part, we can't apply some kind of hindsight to this and ask, um, why didn't they know everything? Secrecy was a big barrier. The, the people who were working on these nonproliferation programs had a great sense of urgency and mission, and they had to pick what's the most serious threat here and what can we do about it. But we should realize that with sort of cold and unsparing eyes, there is something to be worried and disturbed about, and that is the long-term and corrosive impact of this secrecy. Um, it envelops semi-politics, and even today, this mindset remains. And if you think that it takes 20 years for it to go away, and you uh, do work in Russia now or deal with the Russians, you see that um, they still fear that we are trying to carry out espionage, that we are trying to steal secrets, that we won't be, uh, we won't exp uh, participate in a reciprocal way with them over and over again. And we have to realize, as I said before, that it, it's not as simple as simply uh, breaking down doors, but also breaking down these enormous uh, barriers in, in, in people's minds. And I think that, in my view, uh, this took a long time, not because of some failure to have vision by the people who are carrying it out, but because of this um, contagion of secrecy, uh, this disease that everything uh, has to be held closely, that prevented them from finding those things out. So, happy to take your questions. Great. Thanks very much. Let's, uh